Friends, you are hearing the actual pulse and beat of passion. A new electronic instrument has been designed to measure the actual sound, intensity, and direction of human passion. Listen carefully. Oh, oh, science is wonderful, isn't it? It's fantastic, I'll tell you. No telling what we'll be able to measure next year, the year after that, and the year after that. Oh, a disclaimer. Now, for those of you who are anti-cockroach, this show that follows will not be for you. Not for you. For you. Yeah, remove my shades here and buckle down to work. This is me, friendly me. Gee, we've got an awful high hum level in here tonight. Have you noticed that? Hello, test. Hello, test. Hello, testing. Hello, testing. Maybe somebody's trying to jam us. Could it be that at long last William B. has finally moved? Uh-huh. <laughs> has L.J. finally made that great big electronic move? I wish that I could have seen a poem lovely as a tree. Oh, everywhere you look, strife. Everywhere you look, great forces are coming into conflict. I mean, to the left and to the right of me, gigantic battles. Hello, good morning. Oh, it's all right. It's just here, so it's nothing to worry about. Hello, test. It's, it's okay. Sure, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't mind a 10 dB home. Uh, you know what it does? It gives me sort of an organ tone that I liked, didn't he? I like that sound. I like that sound of a man coming out of the mist. There's nothing more exciting than to see a great ocean liner approaching out of the great sea mist. And uh, that's an exciting thing. Oh, uh, speaking of strife, uh, uh, for those of you who prefer a kind of a placid life and don't want to look at the battles that are going on among us, uh, I'd suggest that you tune on down the dial, you know, where somebody's hollering, Now, you mean to tell me, Barry, that you? Uh, that's that's uh, another kind of life and another kind of strife. Don't worry about it, fellas. Come on, let's get on with the show. We'll worry about it afterwards, huh? Okay? You know, uh, a little... Uh, I'm a great uh, clipping uh, fan. I, I love to... Because I put these things in, in what I call my vast file of dynamic telltale trivia. Now, uh... I suspect. Holy smokes! Isn't that wonderful? Get out of here! Get out of here! Sure, and be got a little portrait. <laughs> that was great. Did you notice that the home is now gone, friends? Well, uh, we discovered what the home was. One of our morning program luminaries was asleep in a file cabinet twenty feet away from this microphone, and he was radiating like crazy. Old Fitzgerald. Old Fitzgerald had a farm. E-I-E-I-O. la da 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 You notice I'm in a, in a gala mood tonight? And, uh, of course, that's my problem. I, I, I realize that, that people who approach life as if it's one long, vast song, no matter what happens, are in trouble, because most people go through life with the, uh, yeah. you know, the kvetch? You know what is it, a kvetch? You know, the <laughs> well, I don't know. Speaking of fetching, uh, there was there's a great little column in one of the local uh, humor newspapers. One of the, one of my favorite humor newspapers is the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer. No, come on, the Philadelphia Inquirer, one of my great famous uh, f- favorite uh, humor papers, and they've got this letters to the editor where readers exchange views. Now, this is where you find out what's really going on. You know, the New York Times. It'll come out with this big blockbuster uh, editorial. It'll say, the people of America today are concerned with the internal problems of the Bolivian people. Oh, come on, you know. The average walking around guy spitting and scratching and wondering not when, you know, when they're going to put on another rerun of Bonanza. That's what he's really worried about. And here is the kind of constant battling that goes on that I think is highly significant. I feel that if we had a letters to the editor column, Let's say from a typical newspaper published on papyrus, uh, let's say in the 12th dynasty from uh, Egypt's glorious golden period, we would know more about what went on in Egypt 
than the, what we find on the wall of the tomb of some major pharaoh. <laughs> it's a very different scene. Do you agree with me on that here? Fine. I'm glad we're in agreement. Now, uh, here is a letter that appeared on one day in this Philadelphia humor paper. It says, To the editor of the Inquirer, Dear sir, I know a man who grows earthworms all winter long on the heater in his basement just to be able to feed the robins that stay over the winter and eat them from an electrically heated hot plate outside his bedroom window. I think this is a wonderful practice. Others should follow suit. Signed, a Boyd lover of Philadelphia. I'm going to salute that bird lover of Philadelphia. I kind of like the idea of everybody growing worms and putting them on a hot plate for the robins. That's kind of a sweet thought. Well, about ten minutes later, in fact, two issues later, the following letter appeared. To the editor and the inquirer, I am absolutely against the sadistic so-called bird lover who kills worms to save the birds. As long as we kill one form of wildlife to preserve another, let us save the innocent worms and let them birds shift for themselves. I would suggest that worms do not make objectionable noises all day outside my window when I'm trying to sleep, at night, all the time in the morning, and they also do not dirty our windows. Signed, a worm lover. There you go, friends. Strife mounts eternally. The sound of people leaping to the barricades, shot and shell, and the concussion of constant battle and confusion ranks always in man's eternal... You know, I mean, which way are you going to go? But there's only one person I know who has ever faced the robin, worm, cockroach problem honestly and squarely. It's a writer named Don Marquis, friends. And uh, if you're anti-cockroach, I'd like to suggest that you move on down the dial very fast, because this is going to be a pro-cockroach show tonight. Mr. Marquis, who wrote in a New York newspaper many eons ago, created a character named Archie. Archie was a cockroach. But actually, Archie had been in another life. He believed in transmigration of the soul, almost like the Maharishi Kanapada Utahaha Yogi. He believed that each successive period in life is preceded by another period in life which you bring on yourself because of what you did in the other one. It's a little complicated. And uh, he had come back to life as a cockroach. <laughs> No telling what he did in his previous life. Well, you could really tell, in a way, what he did, because he was a free verse poet. Verse libri, as he always said, or verse labre. And he had come back to life as a poet, or rather as a cockroach. And he lived in the office of this big newspaper overlooking Times Square. Sounds like home, doesn't it, friends? And the cockroaches have a rough time, even in Times Square, but they'll go on. And so every night he would creep into... He would creep into the newspaper office, and he's a little cockroach, see? And because he was a little cockroach and he could not operate the cap bar on the typewriter, everything he typed had to be in small letters. And so he would hop all night up on top of Don Marcus's typewriter, banging his poor little cockroach head on the keys to type out poetry. Because, you know, he couldn't stop. He was a poet, really, at heart, but he was a cockroach in body. And so came forth a great body of literature telling men what cockroaches feel about this world that they live in. And he dealt directly with the robin and the worm controversy, which, as you know, has been going on ever, well, ever since there have been robins and ever since there have been worms. And so would you please give me some real deep-dyed rotten, the kind of, I want, I want the kind of, Herb, I want the kind of cockroach music that sounds the way it smells behind a 42-year-old icebox, third floor back, the one that's just on the other side of the long hall with the yellow light bulb hanging, okay? Oh, that's deep down, hairy cockroach music, please. And now I am speaking as Archie the Cockroach. And I tell you this poem I wrote, boss, and it's called The Robin and the Worm. Now remember, he's a New York cockroach, so he speaks with a little New York accent, see? The robin and the worm. A robin said to an angle worm as he ate him, I am sorry, but a bird has to live somehow. 
the worm, being slow-witted, could not gather his descent into a wisecrack and retort. He was effectually swallowed before he could turn a phrase. By the time he had reflected long enough to say, but why must a Boyd live, he felt the beginnings of a gradual change invading him. Some new and uh, disintegrating influence was steaming along him from his positive to his negative pole. You know, worms have positive poles, boss, and they have negative poles. And he did not have the mental stamina of a Jonah to resist the insidious process of assimilation, which comes like a thief in the night. Demons and fish hooks, he exclaimed. Demons and fish hooks, I am losing my personal identity as a worm. My individuality is melting away from me. Odds crawl, I am becoming part and parcel of this bloody robin. So help me. I am thinking like a robin and not like a worm any longer. Yes, yes, I even find myself agreeing that a robin must live. I still do not understand with my mentality why a robin must live, and yet I swoon into a condition of belief. Yes, yes, by heck, that is my dogma, and I shout it. A robin must live. Amen, said a beetle who had preceded him into the interior. That is the way I feel myself. Is it not wonderful when one arrives at the place where he can give up his ambitions and resignedly nay, even with gladness, recognize that it is a far, far better thing to be merged harmoniously in the cosmic all. At this comfortable situation in his midst, so effected the marauding robin that he perched upon a blooming twig and sang until the blossom shook with ecstasy. He sang, I have a good digestion, and there is a God after all, which I was wicked enough to doubt yesterday when it rained. Breakfast, breakfast, I am full of breakfast. And they are at breakfast in heaven. They breakfast in heaven. All's well with the world. So intent was this pious and murderous robin in his own sweet song that he did not notice. Oh, but hit up the cat sneaking up towards him. She pounced just as he had extended his larynx in a melodious burst of thanksgiving. And he went the way of all flesh. The way of all flesh. Fish and good red herring. Aha, purred Mahitable, licking the last feather from her whiskers. Was not that a beautiful song he was singing just before I took him to my bosom? They breakfast in heaven, all's well with the world. How true that is. And yet even his song echoes in the haunted woodland of my woodruff. Peace and joy in the world and all over the provident skies. How beautiful is the universe when something digestible meets with an eager digestion. How sweet the embrace when Adam rushes to the arms of waiting Adam, and they dance together, skimming with fairy feet along a tide of gastric juices. Oh, feline cosmos, you were made for cats. And at the spring, old cosmic thing, I dine and dance with you. I shall creep through yonder tall grass and see if, peradventure, some silly fledgling thrushes, newly from the nest, be not floundering therein. I have a gusto this morning. I have a hunger. I have a yearning to hear from my stomach further music in accord with the mystic chanting of the spheres of the stars that sang together in the dawn of creation, prophesying food for me. I have a faith that providence has hidden for me in yonder tall grass still more ornithological delicatessen. <laughs> wow. Well, oh, gaily let me strangle. What is gaily given? Oh, well, boss... This is old, aren't you talking now? There is something to be said for the lyric and imperial attitude. Believe that everything is for you until you discover that you are for it. Sing your faith in what you get to eat right up to the minute you are eaten. For you are going to be eaten. Will the orchestra... This is Archie speaking again, boss. Will the orchestra please strike up that old uh, King Tut jazz? While I dance a few steps, I learned from an Egyptian scarab... And someday I will narrate to you the most merry, light-headed wheeze that the skull of Yorick put across in answer to the melancholy of the Dane, and also what the ghost of Hamlet's father replied to the skull, not forgetting the worm that wriggled across one of the picks the grave diggers had left behind. For the worm listened and winked at Horatio while the skull and the ghost and the prince talked, saying that <laughs> there are more things twixt the vermiform appendix and nirvana that are dreamt of in thy philosophy, Horatio. Oh, yes. Faulty riddle, faulty roll. Must every parrot be a pal? Signed, your old friend, 
And sometimes I hate to think like this, boss. I know it upsets you in the morning when you're going out for your coffee. Signed, Archie the Cockroach. Oh. Hold it there, hold it there, and you reset that in there. You see what I mean? Six of one, half a dozen of the other eat or be eaten. It's a hard and cruel world. Oh, that reminds me, this is W.O.R. In Fun City. And I don't know of anything more fun, friends, than a snoot full of Millers. Our Uh Miller High Life can became jealous of our bottle. It was a matter of color, really. There was our world-famous crystal-clear bottle with all that golden, gleaming Miller High Life showing through. There was the bottle, so inviting, appetizing, and downright distinctive. Well, our can developed what you might call a guilt complex. You understand, everyone liked the can, but it was hardly descriptive of the hearty, robust flavor of Miller High Life beer. So when this jealousy thing cropped up, the brewers of Miller High Life created Champagne Gold... Now the can is happy. Looks great in champagne gold. The next time you shop, remember to pick up Miller High Life in champagne golden cans. Very distinctive. Cold, bold, gold. We're kind of proud that Miller's the only one able to put the champagne of bottled beer in cans. Uh, pardon, gold cans. From the Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee. Friends, we will award you the Blast Figlegi with bronze oak leaf palm if you can give me... What was that the theme of? The sound of a miller. Oh, we have a couple of other commercials here. Oh, I cut my thumb half off for crying out loud. Uh, we have... Oh, say, friend, would you like a fantastic... I shouldn't really bring this up after cockroach stories, but... Uh, would you like a fantastic food experience? Starting January 30th, Mandarin House and Mandarin East are celebrating the Chinese New Year with a traditional 10-course New Year banquet Mandarin style. And let me tell you, those Mandarins lived, if you'll excuse the expression, high off the hog. If you... <laughs> that's why they call them Mandarins, by the way. And if you would like to have a fantastic New Year's banquet Mandarin style, you better get on the stick and give a call. The menu is different each year, and this is the year of the monkey. And uh, now, you know, it's not the other monkey, monkey. But uh, this is the year of the monkey, and this is a traditional menu for that particular year. Oh, by the way, I'll, 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 speaking of other great, uh, great uh, trivia questions, I will ask you a question. It's really not so trivia. This is the, the Chinese, you know, use a lunar system of measuring years. What year is this in the lunar system? Now, that's not a trivial question because like half the population of the world operates on the lunar system. So we operate on the, you know, 1968 A.D. system. And uh, the, the rest of the world, this is not 1968. This is another year entirely. And I will award a brass figlegi with bronze oak leaf palm to the first person who can call up and tell me, I happen to know, now don't ask me, I know a lot of things. What year is this? No, it was not Path A News. And uh, another clue, it was not The Lone Ranger. All right, I'll ask you, uh, uh, if you if you think you know those themes, what was the theme that was used to, all right, I'll, I'll hum another one. Da ti ti da ta ta do la ti ti da ta ta played on the piano da what was that one? That was a soap opera. I'll give you that clue. It was not I Love a Mystery. Okay? Da, ta, da, 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 da. What year is this? Lunar year. Oh, we better get on with this commercial. The menu is different every year, and this is the year of the of the monkey. And if you would like to enjoy a fantastic New Year repast, a la Mandarin style. It's only ten dollars a person. Well, that's, that sounds like a lot, I suppose. But for a Mandarin banquet that takes two days to prepare, it ain't. And uh, you have to let them know at least a day in advance if you want to come down and make this scene. So give them a call. Uh, you have to make reservations. 
And if you're less than a party of eight, you can only make the reservations between Monday and Thursday. Any party larger than that, uh, you can do at any time. But it's $10 a person, and it holds to February 17th, which is the traditional time of celebrating the new year. Uh, the phone number is Watkins 90551. Mandarin, somebody called this is the year of the sheep. Huh? Did I say that? Or did you say that? The year of the sheep, meaning me? Does that mean I'm going to make it this year? Well, this is the year of the sheep. Well, what? when was the year of the monkey? Last year? New Year's the year. Of the, oh, oh, this is the year. Oh, uh, the new year. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm talking about the year that's coming in is the year of the monkey. Yeah, that's right. But what year is it? A la numbering system, you know, the lunar system. Is it the year 48? Uh, 9,926? What year is it? It has a number, you know. Uh, anyway, the Mandarin House is uh, is on the 13th Street between 6th and 7th down in the village. And the other one, the end of Mandarin East, is up on 2nd Avenue off of 57th, between 57th and 58th. Oh, he's ad-libbing. <laughs> Tell him that he's standing too close to an IBM computer. Come on now. 12,942.3 he's got on it. Come on now, fella. That's enough of this jazz. Now, oh, you want to hear another great, uh, you know, you got to look at things. You want to hear a great piece, a, a great comment on the whole problem of tolerance. Archie had something to say about tolerance. Archie the Cockroach. Would you please bring me on that hairy cockroach music again, if you will, please? Listen to this one. Pity the poor spiders. Boss, I just been reading an advertisement of a certain roach exterminator. Boss, a roach exterminator, I ask you. I'm a roach. And I've been reading in the paper about this roach exterminator. The human race little knows all the sadness it causes in the insect world. I remember some weeks ago, boss, meeting a middle-aged spider. She was weeping. What is the trouble, I ask? It is these accursed fly swatters, she replied. They kill off all the flies, and my family and I are starving to death. Well, it struck me as so pathetic, boss, that I made a little song about it, and I shall sing it to wit. T'was an elderly mother spider, grown gaunt and fierce and gray, with her little ones crouched beside her, who wept as she sang this lay. Curses on these here swatters, what kills off all the flies, for me and my little daughters, unless we eat, we dies. Swatting and swatting and swatting, tis little else you hear, until... Soon we'll all be dead and forgotten with the cost of living so dear. My husband, he up and left me, lured off by a centipede. And he says as he bereft me, tis wrong, but baby, I'll get a feed. And me a-working and working, scouring the streets for food, faithful and never shirking, doing the best I could. Curses on these here swatters, what kills off all the flies. Me and my poor little daughters, unless we eat, we dies. Only a withered and withered spider, feeble and worn and old. And this is what you do when you swat, you swatters, cruel and cold. Well, boss, I will admit that some of the insects do not lead noble lives. But it is very, it is, it is every man's hand to be against them. Is this right, boss? Yours for less justice and more charity. Signed, Archie. That's a good line. Yours for less justice and more charity. <laughs> Would you like to hear, I mean, the sad story of the... Um, oh, no, come on, no, 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 come on, now, fellas. That is not the theme of Boy Scout Troop 41. I will repeat the theme once again for you out there. Well, maybe I better blow it on my kazoo. I get a better time. <laughs> It's kind of nice, isn't it? Let's try that again. Very nice. What's the theme of that? That was not. That was not the. That was not the theme of the. Los Angeles Dodgers in defeat, friends. It's something else. It's a. Well, that's a that's a kind of a big one. Oh, would you like to hear the story of the cockroach who had been to hell? Are you a little bit curious about what what the, what cockroaches think of hell? Now listen carefully. 
gather around because this is this is a double-edged little story. And it has sneaky little fish hooks sticking out all over it. Like it has uh, double meanings. Right, friends? It's not me. Well, I, well, I don't. All right, uh, this little cockroach music there. Will you, Herbert, please? Oh. The name of this little poem I'm writing to your boss this morning is The Cockroach Who Had Been to Hell. It ain't actually a poem, boss. It's kind of a thing that happened to me the other night. I want you to hear about it. Because it's very important. Listen to me, boss. I have been mobbed. Almost. There's an old simp cockroach here who thinks he has been to hell. And all the young cockroaches make a hero out of him and admire him. He just sits around and runs his front feet through his long white beard and tells the story. (laughs) One day, and listen to this, boss. One day, he says he crawled into a yawning cavern, a big cavern, and suddenly he came upon a vast abyss full of whirling smoke. There was a light at the bottom. Billows and billows of yellow smoke swirled up at him, and through the horrid gloom, he saw things with wings flying and dropping and dying. They veered and fluttered like damned spirits through that sulfurous mist. Listen, I says to him, old man, you've never been to hell at all. There isn't any hell. Transmigration of the soul is the game. I used to be a human, vers liber poet, and I died and I went into a cockroach's body. If there was a hell, I'd know it, wouldn't I? You're irreligious, said the old simp, combing his whiskers excitedly. Ancient one, I says to him, while all those other cockroaches gathered into a ring around us. Ancient one, what you beheld was not hell at all. It was just natural. Someone was fumigating the room, and you blundered into it through a crack in the wall. Atheist, he cried. And all those young cockroaches cried, Atheist! And made for me as... <laughs> they come running at me, and if it hadn't been for Freddy the Rat, I would now be on my way, boss, once more. I mean killed as a cockroach and transmigrating into something else. Well, that old white-bearded devil is laying for me with his gang. He is jealous because I took his glory away from him. Don't ever tell me insects are any more liberal than humans, huh? Da, 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 da. Oh, I hear you talking. Oh, I hear that old devil. I hear that old devil hollering down the air shaft. Hollering out of the old air conditioning. Saying to me, why don't you get out there and dance and sing? Hollering, yeah. And why don't you lay out a few old wild notes, daddy old, of your own? Oh, 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 I hear you talking. Hey, old devil, I hear you singing. And I hear you talking and yelling and hollering and screaming and fighting and wanting to pull me out there. But I say to you, devil, the next time you got a good deal, da, do, da, da, do, 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 don't you come around here with your sweet talk. But all them lies you've been telling me, ba, 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 ba. I know what you're up to, old devil. No, 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 no. Yeah, that was not bad at all, was it? Yes, sir. Not bad at all. Gee, it's sad how many people. <laughs> Gee, come on. <laughs> oh, there's an old Italian expression. Yes, yeah, say. Well, actually, there's an old Italian gesture. <laughs> it means bring out more spaghetti. <laughs> you know, boss, boss. You know, I learned a lot of things just hanging around with the rest of the bugs. And, boss, I'd like to tell you the lesson of the moth. The lesson of the moth, boss. I want you to listen. I was talking to a moth the other evening, and he was trying to break into an electric light bulb and fry himself on the wires. <laughs> Why do you fellas pull this stunt? I asked him. Because it is the conventional thing for moths. Or why, if that had been an uncovered candle instead of an electric light bulb, you would now be a small, unsightly cinder. Have you no sense, moth, huh? Uh, What do you think he said, boss, huh? Plenty, he answered. But at times we moths get tired of using all our sense. We get bored with the routine and crave beauty and excitement. Fire is beautiful. And we know that if we get too close to it, it will kill us. We know that. But what does that matter? It's better to be happy for just one moment and be burned up with beauty than to live a long time and be bored all the while. So, 
we wad up our life into one little roll, and then we shoot the roll. That is what life is for. It is better to be a part of beauty for one instant and then cease to exist than to exist forever and never be a part of beauty. Our attitude toward life is come easy, go easy. We are like human beings. Used to be, that's used to be, before they became too civilized to enjoy themselves. Easy come, easy go. And you know, boss, before I could argue him out of his philosophy, what do you think he did? He went and immolated himself on a patent cigar lighter. I do not agree with him myself. I would rather have half the happiness and twice the longevity. But, boss, I got to admit, at the same time, I wish there was something I wanted as badly as he wanted to fry himself. Just one thing. Signed, Archie. It makes you think, boss. <laughs> oh, 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 I hear you calling. I hear you calling, you old red hot flame. I hear you calling. I hear you sizzling and crying. I see you popping and sizzling and dying, old red hot flame. Oh, 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 oh. And I know, I know you ain't no good. You ain't no good for me, but I got to go, I got to go, I got to go. So here I go, friends, I'm flapping these wings, these great big wings, ba ba boo boo yeah. Holy smokes. It sure ain't the Martha Dean show tonight. la dee 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 Speaking of great announcements, don't forget, uh, this Friday night, we are going to be at the Raritan Valley Hospital. And I'm going to wear my big moth wings. Well, we're not going to be there, of course, but we're doing a big show for them. It's going to be at the Middlesex High School Auditorium on Route 28 in Middlesex, New Jersey. And uh, it's going to be Friday, January 26th at 8 o'clock. That's p.m. And we will go out on the stage and uh, probably by 8.17 we will possibly be busted. However, uh, <laughs> we're going to be there, and, uh, and uh, it's going to be a big benefit for the new Raritan Valley Hospital. It's a great-looking hospital, and, uh, you know, beautiful architecture. I mean, you know, if you have a bad knee, you might as well go to some place where it's pretty, I always say. And uh, it's, it's pleasant, you know. It's like, uh, it's the first hospital I ever saw that is based on the, uh, well, how can I say it, the um, Howard Johnson Elf type architecture. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of nice. You know, you look for 28 flavors and all that. But uh, nevertheless, uh, it's going to be Friday night at 8 o'clock. And if you'd like to get there, you better call real quick, man, in the morning. Like in the morning, between 9 and 4, you call this number, 201. That's out in Jersey. Out there in T.S. Eliot's Old Wasteland. That's 201. And the number to call is 968-6000. 968 6000 Oh, yeah, there's just so much to learn from the cockroaches, you know. They they uh, uh I, I remember as a kid, you know, I learned I learned a great deal about cockroaches as a kid because um well, cockroaches and kids and toads and and uh newts and uh, lizards and snakes and they all live on a parody, you know. I mean, very few kids make any value judgments about cockroaches or snakes or Lizards, or oh, they may once in a while go, ick. But then on the other hand, you know, the cockroach probably goes, ick, too. Can I? So this is kind of a give and take. And, and I'm this kid, and me and Schwartz and Brunner, we had this friend that uh, hung around for a long time until he moved away, old Doppler. And that, uh, yeah, Doppler, old George Doppler. And that uh, George Doppler lived in one of the great houses. It's, it's, it's always affected my attitude. Ever since I was a kid and I knew George Dopper's house, my attitude towards living and how people live in a house and what kind of a house is a great house has forever been affected. Now, if you grow up in a family where your idea of a great house is the most scrubbed look, you know, the house that has the, the white walls, has the white rug, it has uh, everything cleaned down to the last nth degree and there isn't a pile of old used footballs in the corner and old busted up tire jacks down in the basement and all that stuff. Well, you possibly wouldn't understand this. But that Doppler lived in a house that to me was sheer magic. 
because it was a house that was total shambles. I mean, you had to wade through his house. That's right. He had this big, fat mother who looked a little bit like Tugboat Annie. Mrs. Doppler, oh, she was great. And I always remember Mrs. Doppler leaning over her kitchen table, which was one of these white enamel type, you know, the little chips off all around, leaning over, and she had this big board, and she was always making bread. She was the only lady I ever knew who made bread. You know, our bread was always something that came with Lone Ranger. I was, I was, I, <laughs> all right, what bread, what bread sponsored Lone Ranger, you smart guy? And they, and I'm, hi oh, Silver! And the announcer would come on and say, fellas and gals, do you know that Lone Ranger and Tonto, every night when they sit down and, and start stewing up the venison, what do you think? What kind of a bread do you think that they, as every morning, Tonto and Ranger have it with their breakfast, uh, toasted? Somehow the idea of Tonto and the Ranger out in the old west sitting there toasting bread in the morning, you know, with the Indians coming over the hill, uh, you know, it's good. so we ate that kind of bread all the time, and I will award you a brass figure, and it was not Wonder Bread, France. And Pepperidge Farm was... Oh, no, no, no. That was far too esoteric for us. No, you know, whenever I hear these guys talking about this bread, that they say, you know, the bread is mostly... They, they talk with scorn. They say, well, how are you going to like a bread that's mostly air that puffs up and it's all like that? No, that's the kind of bread I like. I like bread that's just like, you know, football. You can just squeeze it. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can take you know, some of this bread. You know, you can take a hand, a handful, just to take one slice of this bread, see, and you roll it up. And you can make a little ball about the size of a BB. Out of one, yeah, that, that's the kind of bread, you know. And you can make a little ball about the size of BB seat, and you dip it in bacon fat, and you hook that on the end of a, of a fish hook, and you got a dough ball that does not stop. There ain't a fish in this world that would not break into tears. Oh, oh yes, uh, getting back to the cockroaches. Oh, I got a great one here. You know, you learn a lot about cockroaches, and every, and, and, and you learn not only about cockroaches, but about life when you get friendly with the roaches. And so, me and Schwartz and Flick and Brunner, on those long, quiet afternoons after school, when Mrs. Doppler was off, uh, whatever Mrs. Doppler did, I don't know what tugboat Annie's do when they're, you know, not around the house yelling and hollering and hitting kids, but when, uh, Miss, I never, never, never ran into Mr. Doppler, and there was a Mr. Doppler. You could see all the bottles around on <laughs> I mean, you knew there was a Mr. Doppler here. I'm serious. And so, so Mrs. Doppler's always hanging over this thing, making the bread. And uh, every couple of days, me and Schwartz and Flick and Bruner and old Doppler would come to his house when she wasn't home, see, and we'd each carry a ball jar, and we would go cockroaching. We called it roaching. And we would sneak into the kitchen, see, and all the lights would be on, and it's a long winter afternoon. It's kind of dark and dismal, and then we'd pull the shades down. And, of course, uh, this uh, this kitchen has to be seen to be understood. It was not exactly the kitchen that uh, that the lady plumber spends her time in worrying about coffee stains in the sink. I mean, they had more than coffee stains in the sink, friends. They had a pile of dishes, for example, that were 18 feet high with green mold all over it with hair. I mean, it was that kind of place. It was just great, see. And we would we would hide back, we'd hide in the next room. And then Doppler would reach out and he'd flip on the lights on those rare occasions when Mr. Doppler had paid the electric light bill. And they had lights. So he'd throw on the light, and boom, 87 trillion cockroaches jumping and yelling and hollering up and down. And you know, you'd be knee-deep in them. They'd be clinging to them, yelling. You. They'd be playing ping-pong, you know, uh, in the dark. Cockroaches really swing. So we're running around sticking them in the ball jar. Well, by the afternoon uh, was over, I would have maybe a half a ball jar full of cockroaches, which I thoughtfully took home. You can see this went over like a lead blimp with my mother the day she discovered my friendly little group of pets under the day bed. Where I kept them. Next to my Prince Albert can full of used teeth. So, uh, things. Oh, you want to hear about the, how cockroaches think one day? All right, friends, bring it in there quick. Friends, I went into a speakeasy the other night with some of the boys, and we were all sitting around under one of the tables making merry with crumbs and cheese and whatnot. But after a while, a strange melancholy descended upon the jolly crew. And one old brown veteran roach said with a sigh, Well, boys, eat, drink, and be maudlin, for tomorrow we are dry. The shadow of a padlock rushes towards us, like a Sahara sandstorm flinging itself at an oasis. For years, myself and my ancestors before me have inhabited yonder icebox. But the day approaches when our old homestead will be taken away from here and scalded out. Yes, says I, soon there will be nothing but that, uh... That uh, soft drink stuff on every hand. I never drank it, says he. 
What kind of a drink is it? It is bitter as wormwood, says I, and the only chaser to it is the lethean water. It is not the booze itself I regret so much, said the old brown roach. It is the golden companionship of the tavern. Myself and my ancestors have been chop house and tavern roaches for years. Did you know, friends, that roaches specialize? Yeah, been a chop house and tavern roach for years, hundreds of years, countless generations back. In fact, one of my Elizabethan forebears was plucked from a can of ale in the Mermaid Tavern by Will Shakespeare and put down Kit Marlowe's back. What subtle wits they were in those days, said I. Yes, he said. And later, another one of my ancestors was introduced into a larded hare that Addison was eaten by Dickie Steele. My ancestor comes scurrying forth. Dickie said, is that your own hair, Joe, or a wig? <laughs> Which Will Addison never forgave. Yours is a remarkable history. I said, yes, he said, and I have the last of a memorable line. One of my ancestors was found drowned in the inkwell out of which poor old Eddie Poe wrote the raven. Ah, oh, drowned. We have always associated with wits, vanhomians, and bon vivants, not to mention bohemians. My maternal grandmother, for example, was slain by John Macefield with a bung starter. Well, well, it is sad, I said, that glad days pass. Yes, he says, soon we will all be as dry as the Egyptian scarab that lies in the sarcophagus beside that mummy of Ramesses, and he ain't had a drink for 4,000 years. It is sad for you. He continued, but think how much sadder it is for me, with a family tradition such as mine. Only one of my ancestors chases. Oh, I'll tell you, when, it's, when a great family dies, when a great family, Archie, goes down the drain, it is sad. Tradition is nowhere. You know, the, ah, but why carry on? Why carry on? Just sit and have a little ale and hope for a better day. Signed, Archie. I just thought you ought to know that there was a historic cockroach that was thrown down the back of Kip Marlowe by Will Shakespeare in the Mermaid Tavern and remembers his family history. Hang loose, friends. Uh...